Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read the same three verses. Now, the study is only going to focus on verse 11 tonight. And I'll explain why as we get into the study. Would you read along with me, please? Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Father, we need to pray. The battle is real. To one degree or another, we all experience it. Probably, Jesus, to the same degree, we all hate it. But it is a battle that tonight, and for several weeks to come, you're preparing us to engage. Lord, I pray that we would be tougher. We're in the last days. Jesus, you're about to come. And we need to be tough enough to be ready and to bring others with us for your glory, O God. I pray, Lord, that you would prevent the enemy from stealing anything that's offered here tonight. We know the battle is going on. It's an invisible battle, but we know that this room is full of spiritual beings, angels and demons. Two-thirds of them fighting for us, a third of them fighting against us. Give us hearts, Lord, that we would be persuaded by your holy angels. And give us faith to believe, to really believe the promises that you make. The battle is real. We can't avoid it. So equip us to be instruments for your glory. I pray finally, Lord, if there's anybody here tonight or anybody watching online and they've not yet surrendered their life to you, I pray that tonight you will offer them not only forgiveness of sins, but for protection against these dark spiritual forces. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. And now strengthen us that we can fight with you and for you all the while accomplishing the mission that you've provided for us as we await your soon return. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. In the meantime, let's all of us be ready to rumble. <laughs> Amen. Two baseball seasons ago, and we've got baseball fans here in the church, the Houston Astros won the World Series. Everybody in Texas was really happy, and at least especially in Houston, they were really, really proud. We did it. We did it. The celebration was enormous. But then it came out that they were cheating. They were cheating. Now, I'm a baseball player. I, I played college baseball. I wanted to play pro baseball. Just wasn't good enough to do it. But the Astros were stealing signs. That was what they were doing, cheating. Stealing signs has been a part of baseball from the beginning. What the Astros did was take it to a whole new level. They got technology involved. They hired people to, to, to spy. They had cameras and eyes everywhere. And you see, they knew what pitches were coming. Now, baseball has always been this charade. You know, the catcher disguises the signals, but everybody knows that one's a fastball, two's a curve, three's a changeup or a slider. <laughs> everybody knows that, and there's only so much they can do, and they do their best to try to hide it. But the Astros were so modern with this that they knew what was coming. And so before the pitch came, they were in the dugout banging on garbage cans to signal the pitch to the batter. And it worked because they just hit everything. Some of the players had career years. And they won the World Series, which of course is the goal of every baseball team. But when it came out that they were stealing signs, suddenly everybody was mortified. I can't believe they were cheating. People have been cheating in baseball forever. But 
They did it so they would know the pitch that was coming. Well, tonight, we're going to steal some of the devil's signs. My goal tonight is to let you know what's coming so that we can be prepared to fight and then next time when we begin with the full armor of God, we'll be able to fight. We'll be able to stand and overcome the attack of the enemies. Tonight we're going to talk about five primary areas. Now there are more. I could talk about others. But just generally, I'm going to talk about five primary areas the devil will use to try to stop us from being fruitful in our walk with Jesus. Verse 11, I told you, was the emphasis tonight put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, Satan is no mystery. Peter says we're not unaware of his schemes. Satan isn't original. Now, sadly, he doesn't have to be. He doesn't come up with new stuff because the old stuff keeps on working. So he focuses his attacks on our minds and our emotions. And those are the areas that we're going to concentrate on tonight. The first is condemnation or guilt. The second is doubt. The third is fear. The fourth is evil thoughts. And the fifth, in my opinion, is his biggest weapon of all. It's depression. Because if he can get us to number five, then we just sort of sit still and Satan loves a sitting target. So those are the areas, and I'm going to talk about them at length. Now to understand how he concentrates on these areas, we need to remember that the devil has access to our minds. He's not God. He can't read our minds, but he can plant things in our minds. King David, Peter, and Judas are given in Scripture as examples of the way Satan can work on our minds in our thought life and even to the point of influencing our dreams. Make no mistake, as we often say that God has a wonderful plan for your life, it's equally true that the devil has a plan as well, but his is a not-so-good plan for your life or mine. Now, next week, we're going to start our study in detail on the armor of God, how we can resist these ugly schemes of Satan. But just to give you sort of a teaser, a direction, let me concentrate for just a few minutes on the term in verse 11, the full armor of God. No loving parent would permit their child to go play in a football game without the proper equipment. You know, you need a helmet, you need shoulder pads, you need hip pads, you need knee pads. You need everything to ensure that your child is going to be safe. Well, it's equally true because God loves you and he loves me that he will not allow you. Now, we can resist what he's telling us. We can completely ignore it. But God loves you too much to allow you to encounter Satan ill-prepared. If we will let God prepare us every single day, we'll be prepared. I didn't say you'd feel prepared, but you would be prepared. And that's a matter of faith. We've got to understand that if we take God at his word, if we focus on this full armor of God, then we will be prepared for anything and everything the devil throws at us. That's why, through the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit is going to go to such great lengths to prepare you. But I want you to remember that having only part of the armor does you no good. It's not like you can go out and say, well, I got my helmet, so I don't need my shield of faith, or I don't need my, my, my sandals ready to spread the gospel of Christ. We need all of it, and we need it every day. Without your helmet of salvation, the doubts are going to come. Without the shield of faith, fear is going to paralyze you. Satan has all the tricks. And God has all of the armor that we need to counterbalance those tricks. Remember, Satan hates you. We're going to judge him at some point. 
And every one of us he can take down is one less person who will stand in judgment of him. When we're not prepared and when we give him his way, I've often described Satan. I I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember when growing up they would give you these gifts. My, My dad always had these clowns and they'd blow them up and you'd punch them and they'd just keep coming back. Well, a lot of us to Satan are like those clowns. He keeps punching. We just keep coming back for more. And it's always his goal to get us that place where we stand in front of him and he can just punch and he can punch and he can punch. And God is going to teach us to fight back as we study the full armor of God beginning next week. I want you to leave here knowing how to use every piece of armor. Now you might still be thinking, I mentioned this in the study last week, our first one in spiritual warfare. You might be thinking, well, you know, I don't particularly want to fight. So I'm not going to really get committed to Jesus. I'm not going to give him everything because then Satan will leave me alone. You have to remember that you're in the fight whether you want to be or not. And embracing this battle is not something that we have the option to choose. Perhaps you like it. You think that Satan's leaving you alone, but that leaves you vulnerable to all of these things that we're going to talk about tonight. Please remember what Jesus meant when he said of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay a hold of it. We've got to fight. We don't have a choice in the matter. And I hope tonight you'll understand that. So here's how the enemy works. Let's start out with the first one. It's condemnation or guilt. Now, condemnation or guilt usually follows failure, either personal failure or some failure in your service. Maybe you were doing something and it didn't turn out the way that you thought, or maybe you shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody and they didn't get saved. You thought, I must have done it wrong. That's always the enemy bringing guilt and condemnation. Satan always tries to make the most of anything that we might perceive as a failure and I know most of you, and a lot of you have your earned PhDs in condemnation. You walk around so condemned and feeling so bad about yourself. And we try to remind you how much God loves you and how proud of you he is. And instantly the devil's right there and he pushes that condemnation button. You say, yeah, but you don't know all the things that I'm struggling with. You don't know what I did. You don't know what I said. Guilt and condemnation is one of his most effective weapon. That's why we're told in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now that's a Bible verse you've got to believe by faith because there's so many times, as I said, you're going to feel condemned. But it's in those times when you feel condemned, you've got to realize, well, wait a minute, if I'm feeling condemned, I know it's not God because he said there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it must be the enemy. And then you can exercise your faith to believe the promise of God. Now, every one of us, we know that verse. And by the way, there's so many other glorious promises in Romans chapter 8, I personally decided that if I ever get marooned on a, on a desert island and can only take one page in the Bible or one chapter, it's going to be Romans 8. We all know the verse, but why don't so many of us believe it? Well, the answer is that through guilt and condemnation, the devil makes us feel separated from God. Now, when we talk about the shield of faith... When we get to that place, we can remember, well, wait a minute. The shield of faith, I believe that God will never leave me or forsake me. I can't be separated. And then the whole purpose of this is to help you identify the source of the lie. If it's from the devil, we can kind of push it away. We can take the thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. 
Or we can simply just say, look, I don't want to hear from you. And you can talk to Jesus and choose to believe him. When we fail, when we mess up, we feel so condemned, we feel like we ought to be more mature now than this. And we, because we're disappointed in ourselves, we think, God, you must be so disappointed in me. And the answer is no, he's not disappointed and he isn't surprised by your failure. But he's given you the opportunity simply by saying, Jesus, forgive me. I'm sorry. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And then accept the forgiveness that is promised to us in 1 John 1, 9. And fellowship is immediately reconnected, reestablished. Instead, the devil pushes the condemnation button. Oh, that's the sixth time this week you've blown it. Or the tenth time this month you've blown it. He won't take you back now. God is so disappointed. God is so angry. Now, I'd rather have God angry at me than disappointed. If I feel like I've disappointed the Lord, it truly breaks my heart. That's why we need to remember these promises. One of the ways that we can deal with condemnation and guilt, one of the ways that we can remember the source of what we are feeling is by understanding what it does. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, we are drawn nearer to the Lord. When the devil is condemning us, we are drawn farther away from the Lord. And then all we have to do is be able to say, well, 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 Lord, I'm feeling so close to you. That's conviction of the Spirit. Paula says all the time, she said on the radio show yesterday, I love conviction. I don't like conviction. But she does because she knows it helps her to get right with God. It draws her closer to the Lord. That's the reason we examine our hearts because every day we have the opportunity to draw nearer to the Lord. But if you are feeling condemned and you're sitting around thinking things like, you know, I don't even deserve to go to church. I go and everybody's going to know how I messed up. Or, or well, well, if I go to church, God's going to be upset with me. That draws you farther away from God. And that helps you identify the source of that condemnation as the devil. And then it's really simple. You make a choice. Draw closer to God. Draw farther away from God. One is conviction. One is condemnation. We know which one to get rid of. And all we have to do is remember the source. One is from above, that's conviction. The other from below, that's condemnation. So practically speaking, what do you do when you're feeling guilty about some repeated failure or about being a hypocrite or however else the enemy condemns you? What you do is run to the cross. Run to the cross. Every day, be aware of the presence of Jesus and run to the cross. He died so that you would not have to feel disconnected from him. Confess your sin, be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit, and let that fellowship wash all over you again, and you won't spend one minute being condemned. If the enemy can get you condemned... If he can get you feeling really guilty. Remember the Holy Spirit is always there shouting, but freedom, 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 forgiveness. And all you have to do is run to the cross, run to Jesus in his presence. There's the fullness of joy. The, the presence of the Lord cures condemnation and guilt. Every person who has ever lived has failed a whole bunch of times. So please take my counsel tonight and be a little easier on you. Don't be easy on sin. Hate it. It's ugly and it's nasty and it opens the door for Satan to come. But be easier on you. When you mess up, own it. Ask for forgiveness And say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to run to you. Give me another chance. It's something he will always do. It's also good for us to remember that when you are truly guilty of something, 
it's good to agree that you're guilty because that's the only way you can deal with guilt. I often say to you that guilt is a good thing if you're guilty. I know we don't like the way it feels, but, but when we really own our sin, when we own what we've done, then we can have that approach to conviction that Paula has. You can say, thank you, Lord. You'll never let me get too far away from you because you love me that much. In Romans chapter 8, Paul asks the question, who is it that condemns? We know the answer is Satan. If you will remember that, then guilt and condemnation will no longer be that thorn in your side that you can't get rid of. The enemy is going to bring guilt. Jesus has brought freedom from guilt covered by the blood. It's also interesting and helpful to note that Jesus is at the right hand of God making intercession for us. What do we do with guilt? We run to the cross. We run to Jesus. Real faith in the word of God, in his promises, is the only weapon that we need against guilt or condemnation. The second scheme of the devil is doubt. I don't think I was a Christian for an hour before the devil is whispering in my ear, well, you don't believe he could forgive you, do you? You don't think you're going to get to heaven, do you? And I got to tell you, it didn't make sense to me that God wanted me in heaven, let alone that there was some possible way I could go. But I had an experience with God and I knew I was going to heaven. And I knew it so deeply in my soul that that whenever the doubts would come, I would say, well, of course I'm going to heaven. Jesus died for my sins. And even as a young believer, I understood that there was something evil, something really wicked about the weapon of doubt. We're going to find in our study next week that God is a perfect piece of armor for doubt. Doubt will always be there in every serious step toward Jesus that you take. But we've still got to step out in faith every day. When we do, we need to remember that Satan steps in with doubt and we combat it. Doubt is always going to be there. I remember when I started teaching Bible studies. I remember the enemy saying to me, even while I was teaching, well, how do you know that's true? Now you talk about something that can paralyze you. How do you know that's true? Well, I hope it is. I just told hundreds of people. <laughs> Doubt is always going to be there. How many times do you think that Abraham doubted that he heard God's voice? You're going to have a child from your own body. 25 years. We know how the devil works. Where's the baby, Abe? The devil would say. You can't count on God's promises, he would say. For 25 years after the promise was made. That wasn't God's voice. Every single one of us in this room, if you've been a Christian more than two hours, every one of us has had the, the uh, situation where we thought we heard God's voice on something. Even if we knew we heard God's voice, instantly the doubt comes in. Well, how do I know it was God and not me? Mm -hmm. Doubt is always going to be there. How many times do you think Moses doubted that he heard God's voice? We know that he doubted his own ability. But God says, I am sending you. Go say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Again, because we know how the enemy works, there was always that doubt. How about David? Do you think that he ever doubted he would be king even after being anointed by Samuel? When he was forced for 10 years to hide in the caves from the man who actually was the king, King Saul. How many times... When David was sort of at the end of his rope, running from Saul, do you think he said, maybe it wasn't 
Samuel's right to anoint me as king. There's always going to be those kind of doubts. You want to talk about doubt? John the Baptist. Jesus said he was the greatest man who ever lived. Of all of God's servants, up to the point Jesus said it, John the Baptist was the greatest. Now, he wasn't better than other people. He was great because his message was the best. And John the Baptist baptized Jesus. He said to him, no, no, it's you who should baptize me. And Jesus must have winked at him and said, I know, but this is okay to fulfill all righteousness. And John the Baptist baptized him and saw the Spirit of God descend on Jesus in the form of a dove as soon as he brought him up out of the water. John saw it. He knew it. And yet in prison... Just before he lost his head, he thought, well, well, why is it taking so long? And he sent two of his disciples to find out whether or not Jesus was really the one. Doubt is just the way the devil works. Even Jesus. For a moment, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me. Now, there was multiple reasons Jesus said that. Quoting a messianic psalm, evangelizing from the cross. But there was that moment when the human Jesus cried out, why have you forsaken me? Doubt is always there. My point is this. If you suffer from doubt, you're in great company. Now, the problem is if doubt keeps bugging you, you feel condemned. You're going to see as I stepping stone through these steps, they all are so intimately connected one with the other. When I first believed that God wanted Paula and me to come to San Antonio, everyone around me, it seemed, people that loved me, tried to talk me out of it. Oh, that wasn't God. God wouldn't speak to you like that. God would let you stay here. All kinds of different reasons. And believe me, every mile of our trip here, Satan was in my ear, in my head. Won't you feel foolish if this isn't really what God wanted you to do? And the thing is, with doubt, you've got to keep responding with faith. Let me give you a clue that's worked for me with regard to doubt. I hope it will work for you. When you really believe God has spoken something in your heart, and if you're married, you've got a partner. That's pray together, pray about it. Hear from God together. And when you're in agreement, take out a piece of paper and a pen and write down what God said. Date it, time it, and sign it. Because when the doubt begins to come, you'll have something to look at that will remind you of that moment when you knew for sure it was God. And it will give you the opportunity to remember that it is God who began the work and it's God who finished the work. And doubt won't stand a chance. Doubt is an enemy. A couple of killers about doubt as it affects our lives. And this is one of Satan's powerful weapons. As Christians, we doubt God's word. We doubt God's word. We read the promises. And it doesn't matter what promise, and we just think, well, 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 how do I know? It's for me. How do I know? In some cases, because we don't really understand the word or because we misunderstand a particular passage, we apply something that really isn't meant for us and we think, well, 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 how do I know this is God's word? Every single one of us, if you're going to overcome doubt, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, is going to be our weapon. If you're going to overcome doubt, you've got to know the word, but you've got to believe it doesn't matter what the evidence suggests. It doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter how you feel or what's going on in your life. You've got to believe it. I have chosen to believe God's word. 
And since I made that choice, I can honestly say that doubt has never been an effective weapon that the enemy can use against me. It's either the word of God or it has absolutely no value. God is asking you to decide. The second thing that affects Christians all too often is that doubt arises when we put the pressure on ourselves to make the right decisions. If I would have put the pressure on me to make sure San Antonio was right, we never would have been here. Especially men as leaders in the home, there's so much pressure that we put on ourselves to be right. And you need to understand that you don't have to be right because God is right. He's the one who loves you. He's the one who will redirect your steps. If your heart is right, you don't have to be right. So let all of the pressure go and you'll be free from doubt. The third weapon is fear. Now, honestly, and I want us all to be honest with ourselves, this powerful tactic is one that we have seen the sad effects of all year long, haven't we? For the last year, we've all been afraid. Now, I want to say something. I don't want to be misunderstood. I am afraid of COVID-19. I'm afraid of cancer. I deal with it in so many of your lives. I'm afraid of those things. But you see, the devil would have you stay where you are in your fear, and then he just piles it on. And God would say, no, no, walk with me through your fear. And I think the most troubling thing for the last 12 months that I've seen as a result of the pandemic has been so many people have retreated from an active, vibrant life serving Jesus Christ because of their fear. Now, we can say all the the time that that we want to, that, that I'm not afraid, I'm just being careful. But if we're not honest with ourselves, and let me tell you something, if you're not afraid of COVID-19, then you're not normal. If you're not afraid of cancer, if you're not afraid of dying, you're not normal. But what we've got to learn to do is deal with the fear. We can't let the enemy steal the life that God has called us to. We can't retreat. Now I'm preaching to the choir. But we've got to move in spite of fear. Faith is the antidote to fear. The shield of faith is going to be one of our really powerful pieces of armor. And so what we've got to do is we've got to make a decision. God called me to do this. Am I going to do it or am I going to let fear keep me home? God's called us to share the gospel with people. Am I going to share the gospel or am I going to let the fear of being misunderstood or fear of being made fun of, am I going to let that fear keep me from doing it? And it's something that we need to deal with on a daily, sometimes even an hourly basis. I cannot think of a single Bible hero. Do your own study in Hebrews chapter 11. I don't know of one who is not afraid most of the time. Fear is not something that we have to pretend that we don't experience. We do. I've tried to be as open and honest with you from the very beginning here at Calvary Chapel. I'm afraid every day. I just refuse to let fear keep me from doing what God has called me to do. And that's the decision we have to make. If the enemy wins, then the fruit stops being produced in and through our lives. We've got to be honest about fear and we've got to deal with it. And if we deal with it according to the promises that God has made us in his word, then the power of God comes upon us, moves through us, and we experience the pleasure of God. Joshua was a fearful man. Timothy was so fearful, so timid, that Paul had to warn him, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of self-discipline. 
We need to remember those things. The source of fear is the enemy, it's our flesh, it's the world that we live in. But how we respond to it, well, that's the decision that every one of us has to make. I mentioned David earlier, Israel's greatest king, his greatest warrior, was so afraid that you remember he pretended to be insane around the pagan king Achish. But David kept getting back in the game. He kept getting back in the game. God has a powerful weapon ready for each and every one of us in this battle we have with fear. It is the shield of faith, and we need to learn how to wield it. And I'm going to say something now in direct response to some of the criticism that I'm getting after the announcement last Sunday that we're no longer going to require masks here at Calvary Chapel. One of the things fear will do is cause you to mishear what's being said. I said there are people who are still fearful of that virus who are more comfortable wearing masks. I want everybody to know that if you want to wear a mask, God bless you. Nobody will judge you. Nobody thinks that your faith is weak. Nobody thinks anything like that about you at all. You're welcome to wear a mask. God bless you for doing it. But repeatedly this week, I've had people email me and say, You said that I was living in fear if I wore a mask. I didn't say that. That's an enemy using fear to distort the way we think about things. Please understand there's nothing faithless about wearing a mask. Just remember that when fear keeps you from doing what God has called you to do, that's when the difficulty arises. That's when it becomes problematic. Fear is normal for all of us. I wish, I so wish that I was so spiritual I could say to all of you, you know, I'm not afraid, but I'm afraid always. I just refuse to be paralyzed by fear. And I want all of you to view it the same way. Okay, fear is real. I don't like it. It scares me to death, but I'm still going to serve God. We have no right to retreat to what we think is a safe place. And fear comes in all packages. Fear is a powerful tool of the enemy. Fourth, Evil thoughts, imaginations, wicked thoughts, however you want to view it. Don't you hate it when you're in the middle of a Bible study or you set some time aside for prayer? And as soon as you do that, all these wicked thoughts come to mind. Or you sit some time, set some time apart to read the Word of God. And as soon as you do, you think of about a million things that you need to get done in the next ten minutes. That's just the enemy bringing these evil thoughts to your mind. All of the things that we've talked about are evil. They're all tools of Satan. But these wicked thoughts, these imaginations, are more like a distraction. We we lose focus on what we were going to do or what we knew we needed to do. Because the enemy's bringing these thoughts. Remember that we can't do anything about the wicked thoughts. Going back to guilt and condemnation, some of you feel condemned for having wicked thoughts. That's not your fault. The enemy brings them. We're told to take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. But you can't help the fact that they come. Don't feel guilty because they come. Just understand the nature of the battle that you're in. Satan tries to get our heads full of wickedness on earthly things to keep us from concentrating on the Word of God. That's why Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, this is how we deal with wicked thoughts. Finally, brothers, 
whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Here's the payoff and the God of peace will be with you. Now, I call this replacement therapy. When wicked thoughts come in, we got to cast them out and replace them with the things of God. Think about the things that are noble and true and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about those things. When these wicked thoughts turn into temptations to act out, pornography or other things, instead, refocus, replace the evil thoughts with these thoughts. When the wicked thoughts come, you open your Bible every time. Pretty soon, the devil who hates God's word is going to have to try something else because he knows that you're going to overpower the wicked thoughts with the promises of God. It's not just, okay, I bind you, get away from you. You can't do that. But what we can do is simply say, okay, Lord, I, I want to wash my brain of those thoughts. Now I want to think about these things. Whatever is true. You know what's true? Jesus gave me his righteousness. Whatever is noble. We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Whatever is right. I like to put the word righteous in there. Jesus, you gave me your righteousness in exchange for my filth. That's a pretty good trade, whatever is pure. Go to Revelation chapter 1 and read the physical description of Jesus in the vision of John. It's an amazing thing to read that, and you can read it in about 30 seconds. Verses 10 through 18, you can read it in about 30 seconds, and you read it three, four, five times, and believe me, you're thinking about that which is pure. He who is pure and lovely and admirable. Think about those things. There's an active way to fight those evil thoughts and imaginations. You see, if we don't fight them, if we let them sort of take hold in our brains, then those thoughts will turn into temptations and the temptations will turn into sin. So replacement therapy, not in the traditional psychological sense, but replace ugly with beauty and see what God will do. Number five, and here's the weapon of all of his weapons. All of the first four lead to this. This is where he's trying to get you. It's to the place where you are depressed. It's his best weapon because... If you are depressed, you will not pursue God. This is a satanic attack of the most fear sort. You see, depression consists of all four of the other weapons rolled into one. Now, I think I need to say this because sometimes we're told as Christians, if you're feeling depressed, there's something wrong with you, your faith is weak, or you're not walking with God, there must be sin in your life. That's not true. Christians get depressed all of the time. What we have to do is know how to deal with depression. The enemy uses to get you to sit still or to stand still where you become a, a sitting duck for him. The way we respond is we get up and move whether we feel with it or not. Depression usually begins with discouragement. Discouragement often turns into loss of hope. And if you don't deal with the symptoms, then we end up in a depressed state. And when we're depressed, we are fearful, we doubt, we have wicked thoughts. It's sort of a vicious cycle that keeps repeating itself. And if we don't deal with it, at best we crawl into bed and stay there and don't want to move. At worst, we have suicidal thoughts. Remember, the enemy's intention is to rob, to kill, to steal, and destroy. 
And we have suicidal thoughts, and all too often those suicidal thoughts turn into action. And all because we didn't deal with depression. Satan loves this weapon because he wants to kill you, and he'll use it continually. If you are depressed, get help. Talk to us. We've got an entire staff of pastors. Talk to us. We'll walk you through these things. You don't have to go to a psychologist. You don't have to go to therapy. You don't have to take medication. You need to get closer to Jesus. Now, the problem with depression, of course, and this is another reason Satan uses it so powerfully, is because when we're depressed, we don't feel like getting closer to Jesus, do we? We don't feel like opening our Bible. We don't feel like getting into fellowship or going to church. We're depressed. We don't feel like it. The enemy is there pounding us. What we have to learn to do is the right thing, whether we feel like it or not. No matter how you feel, no matter how badly you're hurt, we have to do, take action in what we know is the right thing to do. We've got to get close to Jesus. We need his strength. But if we stay still, then we're in a place where we're going to be one of those punching bags. The Apostle Paul suffered from depression. Charles Spurgeon, in fact, in Paul's case, three times Jesus had to appear to him physically to shake him out of it. Paul had a broken heart, as, and I'm not equating myself with the Apostle Paul, but my heart is broken so much because of things that are going on in your lives that the devil tries to make me depressed. It's those times I got to remember who you are and who God is. And remember, it's his power that's available to all of us. Charles Spurgeon suffered bouts of depression so severe that he would disappear for three months at a time. You say, well, how did they overcome it? They didn't. They just kept serving God through it. And that's what we need to remember. Now, one more final thought, because I mentioned suicide. I want everyone here to know that suicide is not the unpardonable sin. There are times when the enemy overwhelms Christians and wins the battle, loses the war, but wins the battle. But if you deal with suicidal thoughts, if your depression has gotten to that place, you need to swallow your pride and come in and let us help you. Let us help you. It's what we want to do. Nobody at Calvary Chapel of San Antonio is going to accuse you of having weak faith. Nobody from Calvary Chapel is going to look at you and say, well, you must be in sin. What we're going to do is put our arms around you and say, how can we help you? Because you see, one more weapon that isn't listed in the full armor of God list that we start studying next week is a fellowship of believers. And that's why he tries to pull you away from fellowship. So if you're struggling with these issues, depression, the worst of them, but if you're struggling with any of them, please come and ask for help. Wouldn't it be great to know that every day there's an entire staff of pastors here praying for you? And if you don't want anybody else to know but the pastor you talk to, just say it. And nobody else will know, but he will be praying for you daily. All you have to do is understand that the first order of fighting is actually fighting. Don't let the enemy steal from you. Don't let him lie to you. Starting next Friday night, I'm going to get real, real practical with each of the pieces of armor. So let us, all of us together, get ready to rumble. The fight is on. Would you pray with me?